Well, this evening, as we continue going through the gospel uh, reading, which is reminding us of the Lord's Prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. And Luther talks wonderfully about this in the small catechism, about how in that prayer, we are asking our loving Heavenly Father who hears our prayers to give us what we need for the day. And that's great because later on in the Gospels, Jesus will teach that our Father knows the things that we need, and he knows the things that we need for this life, and he loves us and cares for us, and so he provides for us. And so Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow, right? So you put these two ideas together. Jesus says, I want you to pray that the Father would give you your daily bread. And then he says, your Father knows what you need. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow God will give you your what? Your daily bread. That's real simple, right? It's simple to understand. And as you go through the Lord's Prayer, if you read it carefully, and I know many of us have had it memorized for much of our lives and we say it regularly, but if you go through it slowly like we're doing, every once in a while you'll realize, oh, this is actually kind of hard, right? Because on the one hand, though, it's really easy to pray, Lord, give me my daily bread, right? That's a lot of the ways I normally pray, right? I have a list of things that I want God to provide for me or my family or my loved ones, things I want in my life, and so guess what I do? Because God tells me in his word to do it, I go to my loving Father and I make what? I request and I say, will you please provide these things? Will you please do these things for me? Does anybody else pray this way? Right? That's a pretty common way. Here's the issue that I struggle with in my sinfulness When Jesus says, I want you to pray for your daily bread. I want, oftentimes, more than my daily bread. Or at the very least, God and I have a very different definition of what daily bread looks like. Right? Now, here's what I mean by this. Anybody ever been discontent in life? You're like, in your heart, you're just like, I'm not satisfied. I'm not happy with how things are, or business is going, relationships, whatever, right? And so that is when we bump up against these words from Jesus. I want you to pray for your daily bread, right? We know that. We go, oh, yes, we're going to pray for our daily bread. But because we're prone to being discontent or not satisfied with what we have, we're always wanting more. Our whole world is driven by this idea of getting more or having things that are better, right? What happens? I pray for more than my daily bread. Anybody ever done that? It's okay to admit, right? Like, yeah, for daily bread. But guess what, God? I can pray for even more than that. Now, there's two things that I think we can learn from this prayer, this line from Jesus of give us our day, our daily bread. And both will lead to us having hearts that Proverbs and the Apostle Paul say, having hearts at peace, having hearts that are content with what God has given to us. Because ultimately, that's what we're praying for. Would you give me my daily bread? Because tomorrow when I wake up and I pray again, I'm going to be trusting my Heavenly Father to do what? Give me my daily bread again. Which is what Jesus says. Don't worry about tomorrow because your Father knows what you need. So what does it look like when we pray for our daily bread? Well, Luther will tell us in the small catechism, and Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, the Father knows that you need all those things, and all those things, he says, are food and shelter and clothing and money, the things that we need in this life. So certainly we are called and encouraged by God and by Jesus to go to our Father in prayer and say, I have need for these physical things. Right? And so that's good. So don't feel bad for that. Right? We are to go to God and say, this is the daily bread that I need in this earthly life. And the good news is that our Father knows that and cares enough for us to provide for us as his children. 
But I also think that there's something spiritual here that Jesus is talking about of we need daily bread. Because ultimately what Jesus is getting at is your daily bread is a shorthand version of saying everything you need for life, right? Right? When we are asking God, give me my daily bread, give me my daily substance, what we're saying is I need you to give me the things that I need for life. And so on the one hand, we know that, and God knows, because he made you, here's the things that you need for life. Here are the physical things. But when we pray our daily bread, I often think that, at least for myself, I stay really focused on the physical stuff. I don't know about you, but like when I'm thinking that I get to the daily bread, and this is how my dad taught me how to pray this prayer, is you can ask God for all those things that you need in this life to provide for you. But we also know from Jesus that we need more than just the physical stuff for life, right? And this is what our gospel reading this evening and the temptation of Jesus is all about. Satan, the tempter, the accuser shows up and he goes to war with Jesus in the desert, in the wilderness, and begins to attack his identity as the son of God and puts all these challenges before him. And in verse 3, we get the first challenge, which is, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, why is he doing that? Because where is Jesus? He's in the wilderness. And he's been there for a long time. And he's been fasting. And so the text will tell us that he is hungry and thirsty and weak. And so what is one of the things that Jesus needs in that moment? Physical food, right? Like this. He needs something for his physical body. And so Satan comes along and says, here's what you need for life. Just turn these stones into bread. And yet Jesus is confronting Satan, but also teaching us at the same time of, you need more for life than just bread. You and I need more for the life that God intends for us than just the physical things of the world. And so Jesus answers him. He says, it is written, man or humanity shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So I'm assuming many of you have heard that passage before. But one of the things I want you to see is that Jesus is saying, look, Bread is important. Jesus was hungry. The Bible tells us he was hungry. He knows he needs food. He knows people, we need our daily bread. We need physical things in this life. But when Satan confronts him, Jesus tells Satan, and therefore teaches you and me as his followers, but people also need something more than that for true life that he came to give. And so Jesus says, we don't just live off of bread alone. Now, like, he's not just talking about bread, but all food and all physical things. He's saying, we don't just live off of that stuff alone. It's not the only source of our life. In fact, he's saying what the real source of life is, is God's word. That becomes our substance. That becomes the thing that gives us the life God intends for us. Now, one of the interesting things is what Jesus says, every word, it's the Greek word grammati, and it means everything that God has spoken, which for us would be what? The Bible. That was not a trick question, y'all, okay? (laughs) Right, everything that the Lord has spoken, every time the Bible goes, thus says the Lord, right? And the Lord spoke, and the Lord said, Jesus is saying, that is what gives life to people. So he's not dismissing the fact that we we actually need daily bread. But he's trying to open our eyes to see something greater as a need for us, as people, as humans created in the image of God. We need God's word. That's what ultimately gives us the life that God has intended for us. 
So that's a challenge, though. So here's a question. Here's a different way of thinking of it. Jesus says, you don't just live off bread alone, but by every what? Word of God. So I've never done this. I thought of it while I was writing this sermon, so I am guilty. Okay, so don't, I'm not judging you. All right? I've never done this, but it occurred to me this week as I was preparing the sermon, I'm like, oh, that might be a good way to change my prayer life. If when I get to the line in the Lord's Prayer, give me this day my daily bread, instead of only listing off the food and physical things that I need of this life, what if I started asking God, would you give me more of your word? Would you give me a greater desire for every word that comes from your mouth? Because Jesus is saying what? Well, that's what we really live by. What if we transformed our prayer lives and say, yes, Lord, I need all of these things, and God loves you, and he says the Father already knows you need them, and he knows they're important, but don't forget what else is important for your life, which is his word. So what if we shifted our prayer lives and said, yes, Lord, I need all these things, but I also need your word in my life. Would you give me more of that? Now, as your pastor, I have berated you as much as I possibly can to always be reading your Bibles, right? And I will continue to berate you and yell at you and also cheer you on and encourage you, positive things too, okay, to continue being in God's Word. Now, here's why I do that. It's not just so I can go and I had a pastor's meeting this week and I can go to a pastor's meeting and be like, you know how many of my church members are reading their Bibles more than yours, right? Like, it's not a contest that I'm trying to win. All right, it'd be cool, though. You could help me out. All right. <laughs> All right. But because I want you to actually have life. I want you to have life in your hearts and your soul. I want you to see that God intends for you bigger and better things, a fullness of life that goes beyond just the physical daily bread that I need. And in fact, in John chapter 5, Jesus gives us a wonderful teaching where he's confronting the Pharisees as often they clashed. And one of the things that the Pharisees were really known for were being in God's word. They knew how to quote it. They had it memorized. They were the teachers of it. And yet they were missing something because they were searching the scriptures for how to do life and everything. And and so often we do this in our culture. I'm searching for the scriptures for, you know, just, you know, some practical tips, a little nugget of wisdom, whatever it might be. And here's what Jesus says to them and to you and me. He says in John chapter 5, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness or point towards me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now, here's what makes God's word, as Jesus says, every word that comes from his mouth, the source of our life more than any other kind of daily bread. It's not that it's an instruction manual for your life. It's not that it is, you know, going to give you some rules or things to do and not do. And if you do them, it would be good. If you don't do them, it's going to be bad or anything like that. The reason we agree with Jesus when he says, no, the bread of life that really gives life is God's word is because, as Jesus says, it points to him. And when I see him and I believe him and I learn about him and grow in him through God's word, Jesus says, you get eternal life. And see, when Jesus speaks about life and the life that he has come to give to you, me, and every other person, the kind of life he's talking about is eternal life. It's the only life that matters. He's not talking about the day-to-day things, even though he says these are important and I love you and I know how to take care of you and provide for you, so pray about them. See, we often think of, oh, well, if that's going to be the source of life, that's going to give me a fullness of life. By default, I think we often think of more stuff, more things here and now. And yet when Jesus speaks about life, 
He says, this is why I want you in the word, because when you look at the scriptures and you find me, you get eternal life. When Jesus speaks about life, he's saying, no, it's an eternal, everlasting life with the Father. So the reason as your pastor, I want you in God's word so often, as often as you can be, is because Jesus says it points to him, and when you get him, you get eternal life. You get everything that we need from God. And so when he's confronting Satan, and Satan loves not just to tempt Jesus, but he wants to tempt you and attack you as well. Right? In the same way that he attacks Jesus all three times is if you're the son of God. And you know what? Throughout the New Testament, guess what you and I are called? Sons and daughters of God, children of God. So Satan attacks us the same way. He says, well, if you're really a daughter of God, if you're really a son of God, then do this or prove it by making this happen or prove it by doing something that will make God give you this thing over here. In other words, the same kind of temptation and attack that he brings to Jesus, which is, Oh, well, if you're the son of God, then just do this and make these stones turn into bread. Here's what I mean by this. Satan will always tempt you and me to pray for and desire things beyond our daily bread. He will. He will make us covet He will make us filled with greed. He will make us filled with resentment and anger and dissatisfaction. And he does that because usually when our hearts get filled with those kinds of feelings and ways of thinking, guess who we take it out on? God. How could you, God? Why didn't you give me this? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't your timing line up with these things? And this is why we've got to remember the words of Jesus of what he tells us to pray. I want you to pray for your daily bread. And then ultimately, our defense against Satan, our defense of those ways of thinking and those discontentment and those things and our idols and our heart and coveting and all that nastiness that he wants to bring into our lives is the same defense that Jesus had, which is to tell Satan, guess what? I don't live off of bread alone. I don't live off of earthly things alone. I live off of God's word. And the reason I live off of God's word is because in God's word, I get Jesus, and Jesus has already promised me eternal life. Essentially what you're telling Satan is, you couldn't possibly offer me anything more or greater than what I already have in Jesus. In Colossians chapter 3, St. Paul says that Jesus is your life. It's one of my favorite Bible verses. It's really short, it's easy to memorize. But he says, Jesus Christ is your life. So the way we fight back against Satan when he comes in to tempt us and attack us the same way that he did Jesus, we just respond the same way of Jesus. We say, those things aren't my identity. Those things aren't my life. Those things aren't what satisfies my soul. Instead, it's God's word. And it's God's word that gives me Jesus, and Jesus is my life. And Jesus has guaranteed me eternal life. So I have everything I could ever need because I have him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our life, for giving us the guarantee and promise of eternal life, and giving us the promises that you will provide for us here and now and for all eternity with our daily bread. As we fight against the temptations and the schemes of the devil, may we remember your words that we do not live off of bread alone, but every word of our Lord and God, because it points us to you and the life you have given to us. In your name we pray. Amen.